a very good afternoon uh, everyone on this auspicious day of holi i would like to wish everyone present here and all of our delegates a very happy holi a very happy and safe holi to everyone uh, we have to remember that there is a pandemic outside and that is something that we just can't ignore in no way at all however coming to today's evening this is a part of a 12 part year long adherence awareness series brought to you by netfor it's sponsored by inovocare health soft solutions uh, we have been having this series this is the third installment the initial two programs were on tuberculosis and also one was on hypertension we plan to have such similar programs and with such distinguished guests as yours and we plan to have them all over the year the main aim is to introduce and increase the awareness of medicinal adherence there is somehow in our country there is a evident lack of awareness of, regarding how important is the post prescription journey in order to increase inly introduce that bring that in front of many people we have planned such a year long program which is being successful only thanks to all of your presence all of your uh, very generously giving us your time so i thank you all prof profusely for being a part of our event so without further ado i would like to uh, welcome professor joydev mukherjee uh, before professor mukherjee starts i am dr santanu tripathi let me have the pleasure to introduce professor mukherjee with the very very senior uh, a, a, a very dedicated academic clinician and, and a, a astute clinician of who has been a inspiration to many of us and uh, he is known for his uh, wisdom in the own discipline but also beyond that also he is an example uh, in the field of uh, medical education so i welcome i have the privilege to welcome professor joydev mukherjee and i feel blessed to here as a co chair person with professor joydev mukherjee it's always a pleasure to listen to professor mukherjee so i would mukherjee my co chair to have uh, an introductory note on today's replacement therapy importance of treatment adherence in hormone replacement therapy all the uh, surrounded the science behind it and the benefits and risks of hormone replacement therapy and then of course we have a dedicated session on uh, adherence in importance of adherence in hormone replacement therapy so i hand over to uh, professor joydev mukherjee to have some introductory comments on this and then we'll go for the first uh, uh, speaker of today uh, after professor mukherjee that is dr somak kosh professor mukherjee please over okay thank you dr tripathi for the very kind introduction uh, good afternoon everybody now uh, uh, can i make uh, use of some powerpoint slides yes of course and uh, for that you... for that you have to share uh, i think screen share i i have already i have already shared the screen okay yes please go ahead uh, can can you can you see this uh, can you see the slide yes we can see you can make it full screen also yes now it is okay fine acha now thank you so uh, this is a, a pharmacology uh, pharmacology stage for presentation so i'll just uh, i i'll just introduce the subject and uh, as uh, dr tripathi has already said it is uh, the, the health of post menopausal women now a little bit of uh, a definition of the menopause and uh, it is of ovarian follicular activity so every girl child is born with a quota of uh, oocytes and when this is depleted she enters menopause now 
the importance of menopause is that as the life expectancy of uh, the people are increasing everywhere and and, uh, 70s and some even beyond 80 so there is an increase in the proportion of a female population who are postmenopausal, and, and the average age of menopause in different countries. Yes, here in our country. Now, it is important. The subject is important because one third of a woman's life is now spent after menopause. So, postmenopausal women uh, are a big population, a big chunk of the female population. And uh, understanding the physiology of uh, menopause and uh, the possible management strategies, therefore, is uh, extremely important for women's health in general and postmenopausal women's health in particular. Now, 50 ago, Hormones were and uh, a book became it was uh, who was a doctor and a guy that menopause was a disease. Now menopause was a deficiency disorder and therefore everybody started taking it and um, somehow the evidence which arrived from observational studies also supported the idea, the notion of a very cardiovascular part of heart attacks. Second, it protected women's bones. Third, and all that. Now, come year 2002, uh, landmark study, the Women's Health Initiative relieved, uh, released some startling news for me. Before that, when I went to Lucknow in my talk, or replacement for women and forever. Now, after this study, which was published in 2002, it was found that it was a randomized control trial. The gold standard evidence, uh, it showed that women assigned to take hormones and cancer this trial was called off prematurely after five years and eight years there were two arms i'm not going to the details but an interim then good now it did protect bones it did put off diabetes and it did prevent you from colorectal cancer but importantly the harms that it produced were uh, uh, overtaking the good that it was doing so Obviously, these uh, findings, when they were released, made sure that hormone therapy, the use of hormone therapy, literally showed a huge nosedive. It plummeted by as much as 80%. Now, After this study, people start of more motion, but this WHI study some consequences of hot flushes and menopause symptoms. Now you have so menopause transient, but uh, which may stay for. effects in the effects people forever 
or for years together 10 years 20 years 30 years because they felt that it prevented heart attacks it prevented fractures and it was uh, good for uh, the brain also now this distinction between control of acute symptoms and uh, prevention of chronic disease these are two completely different areas w was not a trial which was not enough to diagnose with symptoms who were taking hormones for a short term so WHI findings should not be extrapolated for the acute symptomatic women at menopause. So symptomatic women for menopause are well entitled to their quota of hormone therapy. And uh, importantly, after the WHI looked at the Uh, chronic disease a chronic which I look at was disease to control symptoms and it should only be given to women who are symptomatic so not everybody will have menopausal symptoms and therefore not everybody should receive hormones so it is uh, you have to appreciate that it is not a fountain of youth and hormone therapy is not a silver bullet and it shouldn't be used willy-nilly as Manson who was the Joe Manson who was basically the one of the principal investigators of WHI trial which uh, made such a big impression now the pendulum has uh, swung widely and hormone therapy uh, at one point of time uh, in the in the 90s for all these years hormone therapy was regarded as good for all women now after the WHI there came the perception that uh, hormone therapy is bad for all women now this vilification of hormone replacement therapy this concept was extremely overly simplistic as was this uh, as was the uncritical adulation for hormone therapy before the publication of WHI. So we now know that there is a middle path that we need to tread and hormone therapy is needed only to address symptoms. So it is almost should not be used when there are no symptoms. It should be used at the lowest effective dose and uh, this dose should take care of uh, the of meeting the goals of the hormone therapy that is the menopausal symptoms and uh, the ongoing reassessment of the balance of risks and benefits needs to continue so i think uh, we are going to have a lot of discussion on the on the pharmacological aspects of hormone therapy and uh, the I, I believe there is also a discussion on uh, the physiology of uh, menopause and the hormonal changes. So I'll just uh, stop over here and ask the chairperson or uh, Dr. Tripathi to continue with the other sessions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Mukherjee. You have very nicely uh, set the stage and uh, it is now we have to take it forward. We understand now that uh, we have to take a very balanced look as on today. Uh, things have changed since the last millennium 
and uh, now then again there was a kind of as you have very nicely described that uh, there was a time when uh, it is good for everybody all women and then the, came the who hi study and then uh, everybody was again said very critical about it but then we have to now current position is we have to take a very balanced view and as you have suggested your view is to uh, try to rather uh, treat the symptoms when they appear instead of trying to actually prevent all sorts of complications whether it is fracture or whether it is uh, cardiac problems or the uh, uh, or the uh, cognition and preventing stroke etc so thank you very much we'll have more to hear i think the next speaker is dr somo ghosh who is a, a consultant endocrinologist we'll uh, listen to dr ghosh to try to hear from him about the uh, uh, pathophysiological basis of uh, menopausal syndrome and uh, what is expected from hrt and uh, if we call it still hrt uh, as per dr professor mukherjee the replacement word is to be avoided because it's not really uh, good to think of replacement of the ovarian hormone so better call it hormone therapy okay so uh, dr somo ghosh will uh, now deliberate on sir, the topic pardon that pardon is, sir dr somi goshami is uh, i'm sorry dr somi goshami endocrinologist Uh, Dr. Somik Goswami will be talking on health issues of older women and hormone replacement therapy, endocrinology perspective. Over to Dr. Somik Goswami. I'm extremely sorry, Dr. Goswami. Thank you, Dr. thank Dr. you, Dr. sir. Not, not, yes. not an issue. Thank you, chairpersons, and and a very good evening and a very colorful evening to all and one on on the occasion of the Spring Festival in Bengal. and when we talk of menopause it is interesting to note that human menopause is actually an evolutionary paradox amongst the numerous mammals that we have only humans and certain variety of whales are the only mammals that experience menopause the other mammals enjoy reproductive function right till the time of their death now evolutionary females of of any category of animals are bound to give rise to more offspring and the more offspring they give rise to that would naturally favor evolution but strangely humans have moved away from chimpanzees several millions of years ago when it comes to menopause because our life span is twice that of chimpanzees but we have a menopause chimpanzees don't have a menopause and interestingly in, in humans women have a 6 to 7 year longer life span compared to males so evolutionary why do females of humans as mammals have menopause here comes the hypothesis which is called the grandmother hypothesis which says that human women once they have menopause they no longer have the burden to conceive more children so now they are grandmothers they can take care of their grandchildren their nieces their nephews they can now forage for food hunt for food and they would naturally produce more than they would consume so at the end of the day it would help give rise to more healthier humans more knowledgeable humans over the course of time and then again when we talk of post menopausal women or again older women older within inverted commas because in women again age is is something which needs to be discussed with a bit of sensitivity so in older women who are the grandmothers of the human race i think it's our duty as physicians to keep them as healthy as possible to give them the best of evidence based medicine so that they help give our grandchildren even better knowledge train them even more well and as dr tripathi and dr mukherjee very rightly pointed out hormone replacement therapy is a term which we do not use nowadays although this was the topic that i was given but for the rest of my presentation i'll be referring to this as nht or menopausal hormone therapy and i'll be dealing with some of the endocrine as well as non endocrine parts of menopause its relationship with metabolic syndrome components of the metabolic syndrome cardiovascular implications and implications on bone health now when we talk of normal menstruation what is interesting is that 
a human in its life cycle undergoes puberty thrice actually the first time puberty sets in is during the intrauterine life from the 18th to 20th week of gestation close to term increased placental estrogens inhibit lh fsh gnrh and there's a halt to puberty but after taking birth within a week or so puberty kicks in again in what is known as mini puberty and in females this mini puberty lasts for about 2 to 3 years and then for some unknown reasons it stops again and of course we know that after that during the normal age of puberty puberty starts again and menarche is is one of the defining signs of puberty in females we know that menarche is a two part cycle the menstruation rather is a two part cycle the first part being the follicular phase or the low estrogen phase and the second part being the luteal phase or the high estrogen phase which is these two phases are separated by ovulation and the luteal phase either ends in menstruation or ends in fertilization but what is also interesting to note is that as women go into their 40s go closer to their age of menopause the second half of the post ovulatory part of the cycle starts to shorten that is the luteal phase starts to shorten the menstrual cycle becomes irregular the periods usually come closer to each other and progesterone production in the second half of the cycle luteal phase starts coming down as i discussed a short while ago that humans experience puberty thrice during their life cycle the first puberty that they experience is during their intrauterine life when the primordial follicles are stimulated to recruit more uh, follicles into in the ovary for ovulation at that very point of time from the 18th to 20th week onwards the reserve of ovary and follicles starts to decline however this decline is very slow very gradual till say women are in their mid 30s after which it starts declining much more rapidly and we know that after menopause at least a couple of years after menopause there's almost no ovarian reserve present at all and as i discussed earlier in the first early part of menopause or in the late reproductive phase what happens is the luteal phase shortens progesterone pro like, uh, production declines but we also know that as even b secretion from the ovary starts to decrease the feedback inhibition on fsh is lost fsh values start going up this increased fsh stimulates more estradiol release in the initial part of of the early menopause period more estradiol at the same time high fsh levels also stimulate aromatase activity which in turn also leads to more estradiol but again there is a limit to this increased estradiol because after a moment of time the follicles are exhausted and following progesterone drop the estradiol level also starts coming down and as was being discussed a short while ago it's it's actually a transition phase unless a woman has had no menses for at least one year we do not tell that that woman has attained menopause the period beginning a few years before menopause till one year after cessation of menses is known as the perimenopausal period and again when we look at the so called normal age of menopause which we learned is actually a retrospective diagnosis it varies from region to region in region with higher levels of nutrition like most of the western world the age of menopause is somewhat around 51 years whereas the indian studies have shown that in indian women the age of menopause is somewhat around 46 to 47 years this is a graphical representation of what happens to the estradiol levels as we age and as you can see the peak estradiol levels are somewhat somewhere around the middle of the fourth decade of life they start coming down gradually at and around menopause the levels are nearly half of of what it would be during the middle of the fourth decade of life and in during the late period after the sixth decade of life the levels gradually decline and of course as you age they decline further now what is interesting to note is that when we talk of menopause it's not merely an endocrine transition that we are talking of 
but there are effects on mood there are effects on on the musculoskeletal system there are effects on the cardiovascular system there are effects on micturition and so on and so forth and if you look at the perimenopausal period most of these effects relate to what we call the vasomotor symptoms or what is popularly known as hot flushes again hot flushes is is deemed to be a central phenomenon where there is there is alteration in the level of several neuroregulators these women have a very narrow thermoregulatory zone because of which they sweat whenever their body temperature fluctuates by as little as say 0.4 degree celsius and of course during the the immediate postmenopausal period or the early postmenopausal period symptoms like vulvovaginal atrophy related symptoms dyspareunia urinary symptoms start to predominate and later on in the late fifth decade of life sixth and seventh decade of life elderly women have more atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and it's interesting to note that although premenopausal women have less atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease compared to males in postmenopausal women there is a sudden exponential increase in atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and they are they are at greater risk compared to males elderly males so we see that menopause is much more than endocrine transition it has effects across several systems of the body and i just now discussed about vulvovaginal atrophy and dyspareunia and it's important to note that vulvovaginal atrophy is it's not something which might trouble an an elderly lady only if she has sexual intercourse but even otherwise there could be postmenopausal women who complain of discomfort when they are exercising when they are say riding a bicycle or a motorbike or say when they are wearing tight fitting garments so it, it it it's something which is uh disturbing even beyond sexual intercourse so that needs to be kept in mind when we are dealing with such an elderly lady now of course as i spoke earlier the estradiol levels in the early perimenopausal period are kept high by high levels of fsh and aromatase but they gradually start to decline as the follicles no longer can secrete adequate amounts of estrogen but what is also interesting to note that with an elevation in lh levels during the menopausal period the ovaries continue secreting androgens because of which there is a state of relative androgen excess and absolute estrogen deficiency which in turn leads to what you can say a pcos like phenotype that is the woman's phenotype changes from a gynecoid pattern to an android pattern where there is more of central obesity and we know that if there is more of central obesity that would automatically lead to more metabolic syndrome and that has been seen in studies where in pre premenopausal women or menstruating women the metabolic syndrome prevalence ranges from say 14 to 45% which nearly doubles after menopause in postmenopausal women you see metabolic syndrome prevalence ranging from 30 to 70% and if you look at the so called phenotypes or the so called factors which predict the possibility of metabolic syndrome we know that gestational diabetes mellitus polycystic ovary syndrome preeclampsia are some of the conditions which are associated with metabolic syndrome it's interesting to note that across studies even premature ovarian insufficiency has been associated with metabolic syndrome which validates the fact that high estrogen low estrogen rather sorry and high androgen levels lead to central obesity leading to increased metabolic syndrome and when we talk of this premature ovarian insufficiency or what we call premature menopause menopause occurring before the age of 40 years its prevalence seems to be five times higher in india at around 5 to 5 and a half percent compared to the western world where it's just around 1% so that again is a condition which which we need to keep in mind because premature menopause is associated with a host of cardiovascular issues a host of musculoskeletal issues which possibly can be dealt with if post post menopausal hormone therapy can be as used in this population at the right dose and at the right time now moving on to metabolic syndrome to some of its individual components what about diabetes 
I spoke of vasomotor symptoms occurring during the perimenopausal period, but the vasomotor symptom is not only disturbing to an individual, but also is a good surrogate marker of low estradiol levels. Sudden lowering in estradiol levels, low, low estradiol levels lead to more severe vasomotor symptoms. And across studies, severe vasomotor symptoms, presence of vasomotor symptoms has been associated with insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. Of course, no cause-effect relationship between the vasomotor symptoms and diabetes has been established, but the association has been found to be pretty strong. Now, again, the Women's Health Initiative, the landmark study that our chairperson was referring to, that too shows that if your duration of the total life spent menstruating is shorter, you have a higher risk of developing type 2 diabetes compared to if you spend a longer time between menarche and menopause. So the longer you menstruate, lower your risk of diabetes, possibly hinting at the fact that estradiol could have a protective role. Across two more later studies, the SWAN study and the EPIC Interact study, the findings are more or less similar. The SWAN showing that lower your perimenopausal estrogen levels, higher the risk of diabetes, and the EPIC Interact, just like the Women's Health Initiative, showing that the, the earlier your age of menopause, the greater your risk of diabetes in an European cohort. And the question is, can menopausal hormonal therapy then reduce the risk of diabetes? Theoretically, we know that estradiol in, in a post-menopausal setting would lead to a decrease in central fat deposition, increased lipid oxidation, and lead to increase in resting energy expenditure, all of which could have a salutary effect on beta cell function, as well as a good effect in reducing insulin resistance. But it's not only theoretically that menopausal hormonal therapy reduces the risk of diabetes, but there's actual hard evidence in terms of at least four different studies showing that menopausal hormonal therapy reduces the risk of developing diabetes by as much as 20 to 35% statistically significant reduction across several cohorts. And if you put together different studies in a meta-analysis, they show that menopausal hormonal therapy reduces the risk of diabetes in a normal glycemic woman who doesn't have diabetes and improves glycemic control in a lady with diabetes when used after menopause. So it benefits those with and without diabetes in terms of improving the glycemic control. But then again, a caveat needs to be sounded out that menopausal hormonal therapy is not indicated for either the treatment of diabetes, neither is it indicated for the prevention of diabetes in a postmenopausal setting. But if you were to use menopausal hormonal therapy, say for amelioration of, of severe vasomotor symptoms, hot flashes, then how would you use it in a patient with diabetes? So studies have shown that individuals with diabetes are nearly 50% less likely to be on menopausal hormonal therapy compared to individuals without diabetes because there's a, a fear that if you use it in diabetes, you might increase the risk of strokes or heart attacks or venous thromboembolism. But actually, if you look at guidelines, they suggest that you can use it in patients with diabetes as well. But in those who are more than 60 years old, more than 10 years post-menopause, or those with established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, or say myocardial infarction, stroke, peripheral arterial disease, you should not use menopausal hormonal therapy because there's insufficient evidence to show its safety in this setting. On the other hand, if you are just obese with diabetes or you have moderate cardiovascular risk, you do an estimation with a risk calculator and your 10-year risk is between, say, 5 to 10%, then you can use menopausal hormonal therapy when you consider using an estradiol. A transdermal estradiol would be preferred in this setting. And when you are using a progestogen, diet progestogen or micronized progesterone, which have a neutral effect on glucose levels as well as lipid levels, would be the preferred uh, is progesterone in this setting. On the other hand, diabetes with low cardiovascular risk, 10-year risk, less than 5%, you could pretty well use the oral estrogens, but then again, a neutral progesterone would be always preferred in patients with diabetes. 
We have spoken about metabolic syndrome. We have spoken about diabetes. Now, what about dyslipidemia? To cut a long story short, menopause leads to an atherogenic lipid profile. Whatever wrong could happen to the lipid profile happens during menopause. On the other hand, if you give oral estrogens, it corrects the atherogenic lipid profile in all its parameters, with the exception of triglycerides, where oral estrogens could increase the triglycerides even further. With respect to triglycerides, transdermal estrogen has an advantage wherein it reduces the level of triglycerides or it's neutral with respect to its effect on triglycerides. So again, if you have dyslipidemia in a postmenopausal woman and if you are planning to use menopausal hormonal therapy, it's almost similar to what you would do with diabetes. High risk established disease avoid menopausal hormonal therapy. Moderate risk can use menopausal hormonal therapy, but instead of oral estradiol, consider transdermal estrogen. Low risk, use oral estrogen, use neutral progesterogens, but if you have high triglycerides, instead of oral estrogens, consider transdermal estrogens because they have a neutral or beneficial effect on triglycerides. Now we have spoken of metabolic syndrome, diabetes, dyslipidemia. So now if you ask the question, does menopause increase the risk for cardiovascular disease? I think the answer would be obvious. If it walks like a duck, if it talks like a duck, if it eats like a duck, it's obviously a duck. So diabetes, metabolic syndrome, dyslipidemia, hypertension, all of these increase the risk of cardiovascular disease in postmenopausal women. And again, there are studies which have looked at association between vasomotor symptoms and cardiovascular disease and have found that there's a very significant correlation between the presence and severity of vasomotor symptoms and the presence of cardiovascular disease, which again, doesn't prove a cause-effect relationship, but hints that low estrogen level could possibly lead to greater atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Now, what would happen if you use menopausal hormonal therapy vis-a-vis -vis the risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease? I think the greatest concern in, in this area is with regard to the risk of stroke because the data seems to suggest that there could be some increase in stroke with the use of menopausal hormonal therapy in postmenopausal women, particularly those with some cardiovascular risk factors. But if you look at the Women's Health Initiative, and if you look at the subgroup of data, there's, there's a difference in, in how the data looks at. The Women's Health Initiative was a trial which had predominantly elderly women. The mean age was 63 years, and these women were treated irrespective of whether they had vasomotor symptoms or not. But when an analysis, subgroup analysis was done, it was found that if your age was between 50 to 59 years, the risk of stroke did not increase statistically, but there was a hint that with progesterone in combination with estrogen, the risk could be somewhat higher although not statistically significant compared to the use of estradiol alone. However, in those above the age of 60 years, there was a definite increase in the risk of stroke with the use of menopausal hormonal therapy. Now, when we talk of this age cutoff, there are a number of studies which have tried to look at this thing, this, this age concept, the window of opportunity concept, and time and again, they have come up with nearly similar results. For example, the nurses health study found that if you used either estrogen or estrogen plus progesterone near menopause or within 10 years of menopause, you might actually have a beneficial effect on coronary heart disease. On the other hand, if you used it 10 years post menopause, you have a neutral effect on coronary heart disease. So again, the timing of therapy could be important. The KEEPS study, which included women between six to 36 months between menopause, actually showed a neutral effect of MHT on coronary heart disease, as, as did a Cochrane review. However, if you look at other studies like the ELITE study or the Danish osteoporosis prevention study, they showed that if you use menopausal hormonal therapy within 10 years of menopause or before the age of 60 years, you could actually reduce the incidence of overall atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So again, we look at a meta-analysis to make things clear, big data put together. 
which shows that if you use menopausal hormonal therapy within 10 years of menopause or less than 60 years of age, you could actually reduce the risk of coronary heart disease. Whereas an older woman, it would have a neutral effect with regard to coronary heart disease. However, when it comes to stroke in older women, it could actually increase the risk of stroke. And irrespective of your age, menopausal hormonal therapy does increase your risk of venous thromboembolism. Although the absolute risk is very low in, in real terms, but the increase in risk is definitely there. And, and the type of estradiol you are using, the type of progesterone that you are using could further influence an increase or decrease in this risk. So again, to cut a long story short, when you are talking of cardiovascular risk, if you are talking of a neutral effect on stroke or a beneficial effect on myocardial infarction, you need to begin men menopausal hormonal therapy early. If you begin it late, you could cause a detrimental effect rather than a benefit. But then again, having said that, prevention of myocardial infarction is not an indication for using menopausal hormonal therapy per se in a postmenopausal lady. However, if someone had persistent and severe vasomotor symptoms, which has shown a correlation with cardiovascular disease, that being an indication for treatment, if you begin treatment sufficiently early, you could possibly also prevent a myocardial infarction in these ladies. The last part of the discussion, osteoporosis, bone health, this is something which is very close to my heart because I find that it's often neglected even amongst us endocrinologists and even amongst people who are directly or indirectly involved in taking care of bone health. We know that estrogen has a very important role in maintaining bone mass. It increases bone remodeling, it increases absorption bone formation, it reduces bone resorption, and helps maintain peak bone mass. Now, from the time of menopause, there begins a sharp decline in the bone density. And what is important to note that in the perimenopausal period and in the early menopausal period, there's a steep decline in bone quality because of which as much as 20% of bone loss can occur during this period. But then again, most individuals during this time would not have a manifestation in, in, in the form of, say, fracture or kyphosis or a decline in height, which might take a longer time to manifest because of which I think it's very important that we keep this in mind, poor bone health in the early menopausal and the perimenopausal period. And I say that it's very important because a fracture, an osteoporotic fracture, has significant morbid effects increases mortality significantly, its mortality rate from an osteoporotic hip fracture is even greater than several malignancies. And of course, it has a detrimental effect on the overall quality of life. So again, the question, can menopausal hormonal therapy prevent fractures or improve bone density? There are studies which have shown that sequential combined menopausal hormonal therapy, which means that you give estrogens for about 20 to 25 days and you give a progesterone for about say 12 to 15 days or 10 to 15 days and you get to see a good change in your bone mineral density particularly at the level of the spine but also at the level of the femur also at the level of the distal third of the radius and the studies suggest that higher dose of estradiol could give greater benefits at the spine compared to lower doses of estradiol but then again the aim of hormone therapy in a postmenopausal setting is to use the lowest possible dose to reduce the risk of adverse effects. Now, do you use menopausal hormonal therapy to treat postmenopausal osteoporosis? What do the guidelines say? The American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists say that women who have a significant risk of osteoporosis and in whom you cannot use other medications like, say, a bisphosphonate or denosumab. They are candidates for the use of postmenopausal hormone therapy or menopausal hormone therapy to reduce the risk of a bone fracture. The Endocrine Society, in its 2019 guidelines, is a bit more specific, which says that you can use it within 10 years of menopause or before the age of 60 years, in whom you cannot use a bisphosphonate or denosumab and in whom, importantly, and in whom there are bothersome vasomotor symptoms 
and you have no contraindications to the use of this so actually it possibly all boils down to early either a premature menopause before 40 years of age when you would use hormone uh, therapy or post menopausal hormone therapy in most cases anyway or the presence of severe and persistent vasomotor symptoms where you use a menopausal hormone therapy but you expect benefits in terms of diabetes in terms of cardiovascular risk and in terms of osteoporosis as well and when we speak of elderly women beyond hormones i think there is a big area that needs to be covered you gain most of your bone mass during your puberty and during your 20s your early 30s so during that period weight bearing exercises maintaining a healthy diet is something which is very important avoidance of smoking avoidance of alcohol ensuring adequate calcium and i would say preferably dietary calcium rather than supplemental calcium maintaining a vitamin d level more than 30 nanograms per ml to maintain good bone health if needed you need to supplement vitamin d because for a variety of reasons sufficient sun sunshine exposure is not possible all of these play a very important role to maintain good bone health now this is something which is not very directly related to what i am discussing but since we are talking of menopausal hormonal therapy elderly women we must also touch upon which elderly women with a risk of fracture or with osteoporosis need pharmacologic therapy it could be bisphosphonates it could be denosumab or in 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 their absence it could even be a menopausal hormone therapy so anyone with a fragility fracture a fracture with trivial trauma in a long bone which occurs following a fall less than the standing height which means slippage on the floor resulting in a fracture is an indication for therapy if you do a dexa scan if you see that the t score is minus 2.5 or lower you need therapy on the other hand if your t score is between minus 1 and minus 2.5 you do something called a frac score and depending on that score you might have an indication for therapy so again when we talk of improving bone health per se prevention of osteoporosis is not an indication of menopausal hormonal therapy unless you have a contraindication to the use of bisphosphonates and denosumab and preferably in the presence of persistent vasomotor symptoms but again there the window of opportunity is very important i'm nearing the end of my presentation but i would like to again harp on the fact that when you are thinking of treating an elderly lady with hormonal therapy you need to keep in mind the symptoms particularly vasomotor symptoms which are more most important keep in mind comorbidities in the presence of say myocardial infarction a stroke a peripheral arterial disease you should not use hormone therapy the the socio economic status because some of these hormonal therapies incur a, a, a good degree of cost to the patient so again a comprehensive outlook is important when you are considering hormonal therapy and when you are considering treating an elderly lady particularly for for vasomotor symptoms of course your first choice would be a hormone therapy in the apps in the presence of contraindications to hormone therapy or when it it's not acting sufficiently you can consider certain non hormonal agents like gabapentin pregabalin or even say escitalopram or fluoxetine in certain instances however complementary drugs or alternative therapies at this point of time are not recommended to be used as per the different guidelines so to have an overview of hormonal therapy if you don't have a uterus or if if you if you have a a levo not gestural uh, ring in c2 in that case you can use estrogen only therapy now whether you use oral estrogen or transdermal estrogen is again dependent on a number of factors particularly your your risk of venous thromboembolism and your risk of cardiovascular disease on the other hand if you have an intact uterus or if you do not have levo not gestural in c2 you use a combination of estrogen and progesterone because if you use estrogen alone with an intact uterus you increase the risk of endometrial hyperplasia and endometrial cancer again there are two types of therapies a continuous combined therapy which is preferred particularly after the age of 50 years whereas a sequential therapy where you use estrogen for the first say 20 25 days and you use a progesterone for the last 10 to 15 days is preferred in the early menopausal period Where where the where the risk of breakthrough bleeding would be high if you use a continuous combined estrogen therapy uh, OCP therapy. 
again i think that i would like to end on the note that elderly women postmenopausal women have problems which are beyond endocrinology it it needs the combined efforts of gynecologists psychiatrists counselors orthopedicians physicians pharmacologists and of course endocrinologists to deal with their problems and i think that on this note i would like to congratulate the team behind this program and congratulate dr samajdar in particular and thank him for inviting me to share my thoughts in an area which needs multidisciplinary approach for proper patient care so i'll end my part of the discussion here and hand the control back to the chairpersons thank you uh thank you very much dr goswami and uh, it was uh, wonderful hearing you and uh, i really like the last slide of yours that uh, women cell particularly very many menopausal and post menopausal women cell is uh, is a problem that needs a multidisciplinary approach and uh, and that also offers a great challenge in our setting uh most of the time given the uh symptoms or given the problem uh the lady would be actually visiting or consulting a given consultant or given a uh, speciality expert and uh but as we hear from you it is quite evident that in order to give the best quality management to a given problem the passport depending on the nature of the problem how it present but then it has to have a very holistic approach towards the management of the uh, health problem that uh, are evident around menopause and beyond menopause of course again depending on what is the other comorbidities associated whether the same lady is also suffering from type 2 diabetes or he had already have some cardiovascular problem and his lifestyle issues etc etc so it was extremely extremely uh uh very no, very very informative very thought provoking and i am sure that it would be it it has been well appreciated by all the listeners today uh i would request professor mukherjee to have a few comments on your presentation and then we can go to the next uh, speaker thank you again dr goswami thank you dr mukherjee please Uh, thank you dr tripathi uh, excellent presentation and uh, i'm very happy that people have uh, taken to evidence based medicine and the medicine people have uh, overtaken the gynecologists you know what happened in the late 90s i was the only person who was reading cochrane and uh, nobody yeah. had even heard the name of cochrane okay now it 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 uh, it was the gynecologists who brought the evidence based medicine because uh, for some reason they were the ones who were most irrational in their treatment and uh, somehow it has really caught up and if you have to make a presentation for people who want to learn it's important that you go through the guidelines and this is extremely important so unless you go to the guidelines you have to go to the primary research and that becomes very difficult because primary research going into every publication these days has become formidable therefore it is best that you go to the guidelines and stick to the guidelines until and you have to know that these guidelines may change and uh, that is uh, i am very happy that uh, most of uh, what he has said is uh, based on uh, evidence and uh, in many areas the gray areas that uh, maybe they are waiting for evidence to arrive but i am happy that uh, what he has stressed and uh, what even i would like to stress is that uh, there is one very important indication for chronic administration of hormone therapy and that is premature menopause now make no mistake premature menopause is something which uh, is often iatrogenic created by gynecologist by doing a hysterectomy and it is very sad it is very sad that uh, you remove the uterus together with the ovaries for for no fault of the ovaries and then you don't put up to make matters worse you don't put up on hormone therapy and you remove both the ovaries below the age of 
Now, this is something which needs a huge change in attitude. So anybody who has a premature menopause will have to be given hormone therapy at least to the age of natural menopause. There is absolutely no dispute about this. But uh, for women who reach their natural menopause, as a gynecologist, I would only give them uh, to uh, the ones who have uh, symptoms. And importantly, uh, we have to make a distinction between a short term and a long term. The short term nowadays extends up to five years. So this is very important to appreciate that for five years, you call it short term therapy. And sometimes it may exceed it by one or two years. But for long term for prevention, whatever your pathophysiologic rationale is, it still is a big, big issue. And uh, the bones are really the ones which are served uh, at any age you start estrogens. The only tragedy is that as soon as you stop the estrogens, the bones start going back to square one. So you cannot give estrogens for a long time because it has a, a lot of problems. And then if you go on giving it, if you stop giving it, the bones back to osteoporosis. So very good lecture. And uh, I, I, I wish there had been more gynecologists listening to you because uh, we could have learned a few lessons which you stressed. Thank you, Thank sir. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mukherjee. And uh, uh, let me make a brief comment here that uh, to, to your knowledge, there has been some audit, particularly in this part of the country. Uh, the number of total hysterectomy, that means with oophorectomy also, uh, happening below the age or around the age of 40. And then in how many cases, there is also uh, menopausal hormone therapy given. So are there any studies or are there any uh, survey conducted? And particularly whether there is any discrimination between uh, such data happening in government hospitals where mostly lower socioeconomic people, they try to attend these hospitals and try to seek care in government hospitals. Whether there has been any discrimination uh, between the lower economic status people, ladies, and the higher economic status, ladies who are more likely to go to private facilities. Your comment on this, Professor Mukherjee. Okay, the problem with this is that uh, you don't get a true picture of uh, how many ovaries are removed uh, without proper reason. And that is very difficult to unearth. Okay, so the reason uh, why an ovary is removed other than disease of the ovary itself has to be written on the discharge certificate and hardly anybody writes down why the ovaries were removed in a case and what discussion took place between the woman and the gynecologist before the ovaries were removed. So in most cases, the ovaries are removed before, even before the woman knows exactly. that uh, her ovaries are being, are being removed. Now this is... Uh, absolutely untenable in any Western country. But that is the shape of things. And uh, when we train our young, young people not to, not to remove the ovaries if they are healthy and the woman is premenopausal, then uh, many people in academic forums would agree with me. But when it comes to the patient, yeah. they only go by their last bad experience. And it does happen that after you've done 500 or 600 hysterectomies, one of the women in which you kept the ovaries did develop ovarian cancer. So you see, you don't look at the denominator. You just look at the last bad case that you had. And this is what evidence-based medicine does not tell you to do. So you have to assess the risk. The risks have to be balanced against the benefits. And this is what people are not doing and removing and then whatever happens to the woman after that, well, we've removed everything. So please don't come back to us. So they usually go to the other people. And the next important problem is that, that if, even if you give it to people, 
it's a huge problem to ask them to take hormone therapy for a long time because they'll return to the society and uh, many many general practitioners would stop the hormones after a few years saying that these are harmful so it is difficult and uh, patients even don't feel that uh, if they have no problems with gynecology why should they be taking hormones so it is difficult all right all right so thank you very much uh, let's now go to the next lecture uh, that is by dr chiranjit bakshi dr bakshi will be dr bakshi is a clinical pharmacologist he is uh, associate professor in clinical pharmacology at school of tropical medicine kolkata uh, dr bakshi will be sharing with us uh, his understanding and views on the hormone menopausal hormone therapy and particularly in reference to uh the risk benefit analysis and how the treatment can be individualized now if dr bakshi are you there and if you are ready you can go ahead are you listening dr bakshi yes sir, yes, sir. Yes, sir. okay uh, if you have your uh, powerpoint if you can you can share your screen okay is it visible yeah please make it full screen yeah now it's fine okay so uh, thanks uh, i i i am very uh, there is a very good there is a very lot of people coming i express Sir. my sincere thanks to the organizers for giving me this dalu sir uh, there is a lot of echo i think there is an echo uh, there uh, is there any other mobile or uh, any other device is open from your uh, yes 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 so you, so you have to use one you have to use one only am i audible now now yeah. it's fine okay Yes, go ahead. Hello. We could not could not hear you, sir. Bakshi, sir. Dr. Bagchi, are you there? Dr. Bagchi, you unmute yourself. Dr. Bagchi, you need to unmute yourself. There is some issue in his uh, audio. Yeah. Dr. Bagchi has been uh, co-hosted. Dr. Sambo, yeah, but just now he had left the meeting. I think there is some uh, technical issues from his computer, so we have to wait for some times, maybe one minute or two minutes. Then, let me call him, sir. Please. Okay. So meanwhile, until Dr. Bakshi joins. Uh, It, it, uh, i am curious to have your opinion dr uh, mukherjee dr joyadeep mukherjee that uh, give, given the advances in the last say, couple of decades regarding uh, women cell uh, what do you think about uh, if we think of gynecology is more about the women's diseases management of women's diseases 
could there be a separate discipline about women's wellness or well-being because many of the problems related to women's health uh, will go much beyond the scope and the uh, perspective of the horizon of gynecology i suppose what is your view on that i i, I would agree uh, with you Uh, the only problem is that uh, in a hospital you are always burdened with people who come with disease and there is a long list of ots or whatever yeah so in a busy ot it's very difficult to go for a well women's clinic but uh, that is the way to go for well women's clinic should be there which would take care and a lot of things can be corrected in menopause which are pertaining to lifestyle and uh, i would put the blame on partially on the gynecologists who are not very fond of uh, giving advice regarding lifestyle modification but for even for menopausal symptoms lifestyle modification does help so giving drugs is somehow automatic when they come to a busy hospital and uh, since i have not done a lot of private practice and uh, we don't have a well women's clinic in the government hospitals so it is very difficult to get things together for consultants from different uh, specialties converging on a well women's clinic and that is a problem i i think right. this would be solved uh, in the years to come but yes i agree with you that i be. find dr sunip banerji very uh, renowned cardiologist of the city and the country is there uh, can i request dr banerji to have your comments on uh, from a cardiologist perspective do you really try to address the uh, cardiological problems in women yes. so long they are in reproductive age group or pre menopausal women versus perimenopausal and post menopausal women do you try to address them differently this uh, is dr banerjee if you are listening to me yeah 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 i am listening and uh, my uh, take on this thing is uh, when it comes to the cardiology this symptom of uh, hot flush is uh, not a matter of concern many people will have atypical symptom and uh, they may have a risk factor for uh, coronary artery disease already and uh, definitely these people uh, may be benefited with a short term course of hormone replacement therapy and the biggest problem comes when uh, they have uh, marginal dyslipidemia mild hypertension and uh, you know when you tell them to take a opinion of gynecologist they frankly just not agree but uh, definitely these are not been addressed you know by being a cardiologist uh, we know the uh, so called uh, uh, perimenopausal syndrome but those are just a few symptoms which comes in our mind after so many years so Uh, the expert uh, people can tell all these things so a multidisciplinary action is eminently required that's the reason i attended this session because uh, it's yeah. really a uh, burning topic where your uh, perimenopausal syndrome may be overlapped with cardiac symptom and uh, whether you should deny uh, the therapy or you should give them Uh, this is definitely a matter which uh, need all the specialists to know yes, yes. Uh, in government hospitals and also in some private hospitals we have uh, experience particularly in acute problems and in cases in some cases of diagnosis issues in chronic problem also medical boards do happen yes now when you talk of uh, women's wellness women's health particularly in perimenopausal and postmenopausal women Uh, all of us would agree after today's uh, proceedings that there is always a need probably to do justice to the uh, suffering women's uh, demand or or expectations that there should be a multidisciplinary approach so as professor mukherjee has pointed out maybe in a few years from now we'll be having more women health wellness clinic in the city or in the country but i think a uh, time has come when we should think of a true implementation of mul multidisciplinary uh, management approach in uh, in these kinds of women's health issues 
particularly when they also have history of multiple comorbidities, whether it is obesity or metabolic syndrome or diabetes or uh, a disease already. Okay. So uh, listening to Dr. Goswami's lecture today, uh, it is very evident that uh, it can no longer be any, any given specialty's domain. In fact, we have to be more patient-centered rather than discipline orientation, specific super specialty discipline orientation. So, so we are waiting for Dr. Bhakti. Have you joined Dr. Bhakti? Dr. Bhakti is, is already on the screen. Yes, yes sir. sir. Yes, yes okay. sir, I have joined. So, ah, he has so joined and his, his first slide your... is on the screen. Huh? Yeah, start. yeah, please. Yes. Uh, can, I, can I continue? Yeah, please, go ahead. Uh, so sorry for the delay. It was uh, due to an internet interruption. And to start with, actually, what I have was saying that uh, Professor Tripathi and Professor Mukherjee, both of I am uh, fortunate enough to have these two doyans in this in their respective fields, like Professor Tripathi and Professor Mukherjee, as chairing the sessions because uh, both of them are my teachers. Actually, Professor Tripathi uh, is my teacher when I did my DM in clinical pharmacology and, and and professor mukherjee actually when after uh, doing dgo when i was doing md pharmacology at ipgmr professor mukherjee used to take classes on this hormone therapy uh, actually the uh, different pharmacotherapies of uh, in gynecologic and obstetric disorders and he has been invited in the department of pharmacology probably i think sir can can recollect those memories and with the and and uh, and our one of our teacher or, or the, my guide professor obhijit hajra was instrumental behind this and professor mukherjee used to take so many classes for us as well as for the md uh, um, uh, gynecology and obstetric students at ipgm here so uh, again i think i will uh, while i will touch upon some distant benefits professor both of the my teachers will uh, correct me if i do any anything wrong and uh, will, they will en enrich ourselves with their with their past knowledge and experience in this field. So, starting with these uh, risks and benefits of this uh, uh, menopausal hormone therapy or hormone replacement therapy, that is, uh, we all know that uh, menopause is a uh, is is, is um, uh, evident. That is, at, at is you can't you can't uh, deny menopause. In, in each and every woman uh, in their life, they have to face this uh, uh, phase of this of their uh, of cycle of um, uh, hormonal cycle during their lifetime. And actually, the uh, the as the life expectancy of the woman and not only the woman but the human are increased have been increased. So naturally, the women also have to face a longer period of time during their uh, postmenopausal life. Which uh, was not the uh, seen uh, 150 years or 100 years ago. So, uh, with increasing longevity, the and in fact, uh, the the uh, this uh, this uh, women also have to bear with these different consequences of menopause because of you as we all know that is happening uh, that happens due to the due to the uh, lack of essential hormones that is responsible for their the productive and uh, function and fertility and all other different bodily functions which have already been discussed uh, in detail by my previous speaker and uh, hormone replacement therapy uh, comes as a rescue to ameliorate all these many of these not all these many of these symptoms which are unbearable to some of uh, them and uh, but there are some controversies because of this uh, uh, publication of some some study reports, in fact, there has been a media uproar in these issues, and in fact, and to that extent, that people are scared nowadays to go for this HRT. Even not only the common people, but also many physicians, they are scared to start with this HRT hormone replacement therapy or uh, menopausal hormone therapy for majority of the population, so many nowadays. So regarding some terminologies of, uh, you know, I mean, uh, in relation to the menopause, there is, there is one uh, situation when there is a menopausal transition, that is the period of time when from when the very start to fail until the last menstrual period. So just uh, before the stoppage of menstruation, the few years, 
maybe three to four years, the, the, the each and every woman also suffer. That is um, uh, an, an aberration from their regular menstrual cycles and that and some uh, physiological and uh, fun, uh, malfunctioning and some bodily malfunctions which can they appreciate and they and that due to the due to this uh, transition and which is called the menopausal transition and it appears usually at around 45 to 47 and 5 years menopause is that the last menstrual uh, period and it actually we don't, cannot uh, we don't say menopause until and unless one approximately one year is elapsed since the last menstrual period and uh, it usually it, it happens around that around 50 years or plus but it can happen um, uh, below that uh, maybe 47 48 years and some women can experience this menopause but usually it's around 50 years many perimenopause or climacteric that is from a greek word and that means a critical that the meaning of that is a critical point in the space around in that is the phase uh, that that describes the phase surrounding the menopause and post menopause is a time after complete cessation of menstruation it can only be known certainly after 12 months of amenorrhea so uh, whenever the person i mean the woman elapsed one year complete cessation of menstruation after the start of this menopause is called the post menopause and premature menopause is defined when menopause happens to some young ladies at least maybe around the 40 years of age that is called the premenopause that can happen due to some surgical uh, removal of some of the ovaries unfortunate uh, surgical uh, removal or maybe due to some other reasons uh, radiation irradiation or so so this is called the premature menopause or maybe some uh, persons it can happen naturally in some uh, uh, below the age of 40 years when it happens in that uh, case it is called the premature menopause so usually this is the schematic diagram of uh, age range. Uh, Dr. Bhakti, Dr. Bhakti, can I request you to skip some of your introductory slides and go to the risk benefit directly because uh, after this, there will be another lecture and by seven, we are to stop. Okay, okay. So, so go to risk so, benefit. So, so I don't some, want some to- Some of these are already been discussed by Dr. Goswami. Okay, 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 that's fine, that's fine, that's fine. So I am skipping those slides regarding the symptoms. Uh, regarding the symptoms of uh, menopause, these things I am skipping. I'm skipping. So I'm just coming to the hormone replacement therapy. What are the types, routes, benefits, risks, and uncertainties? So uh, HRT types, routes, benefits, and risks, and uncertainties. That is hormone replacement therapy. Uh, you all know that about uh, there is about estrogen and progesterone therapy, and estrogen preparations uh, that uh, maybe either in the oral form or maybe the trans transdermal uh, patches or gels. So, and usually earlier days in this conjugated between estrogen tablets, it has been used and it, you all know that is uh, prepared from the pregnant mare urine that is concentrated form of the estrogen and uh, with more than 20 estrogen metabolites and uh, it is, and, and the main component is equilin and that is available also uh, marketed uh, uh, and as a marketed product and uh, esterol pellets also can be given in, as subcutaneous implants and so estrogens are also uh, uh, available estrogen preparations which are which can be used as a, as uh, uh, vaginal tablets or creams or esterol creams and esterol vaginal ring or pesadi like and uh, also the transdermal patches or gels and uh, it's, it's also available in our country in the name of Estragist, TTS, Estragist, MMX, etc. So, and also uh, the, the uh, actually the equivalent parental uh, dosage of this estrogen, different estrogens are the estradiol 0.1 milligram equivalent to ethylene estradiol 0.1 milligram equivalent to conjugated estrogens 10 milligram and so. So, Next is that progestogen, progestogen or progestosonal agents. And progestosonal agents actually, they are originally developed to replace the natural progesterone. And, but now uh, the progesterones are usual, usually they are uh, available as synthetic products. And there are two types of uh, progestogens. One is that is progest either progesterone, progesterone derivatives, that is C, uh, carbon 21 components. Another uh, is the 19 not testosterone derivatives called strains. And uh, 
the progesterone derivatives are metroxy progesterone acetate magistral acetate didrogesterone hydroxy progesterone caproate and newer component of progesterone derivative is the normogestrel acetate and 19 not testosterone derivatives they have they are they are criteria is that they are having the androgenic property the older one that is in in the 19 uh, 50s and 60s they have some they have been uh, discovered and main components were then norethindrone and linesterol they have developed in the 1950s and 60s and they have additional weak estrogenic and androgenic properties anabolic and potent anti ovulatory action but nowadays uh, newer components have developed in 1980s and between 1980s to 90s and which are named after the desogestrel not gestimate and uh, 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 even the uh, gonad they are called as gonans and these uh, uh, these are uh, having uh, very protein they are very potent progestins they have having strong anti ovulatory action that is their benefits and even at the at, at the dosage of 40 microgram per daily dose they are they are effective as anti ovulatory reaction but they are, they they have uh, in spite of having their uh, anti high anti ovulatory reactions they don't antagonize the beneficial action of the estrogen on lipid profile and preferable in women with the hyperandrogenemia so these are the quite newer developments of in the uh, in the uh, 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 development of this uh, discovery of the progesterone agents and spironolactone derivatives the drospelin on tablets are also available they are also uh, used in, in combination with the estradiol some other progesterone agents like uh, levonorgestrel intrauterine system which is commonly available as mirena this is also available and they are meant for the endometrial protection mainly the progesterone agent meant for the endometrial protection now another component is tibolon which has been specifically de uh, designed as an H hrt that is a hormone replacement therapy and uh, this, uh, this there are three metabolites this is a high high est uh, estrogenic progesterone and weak androgenic activity and this is a, uh, a pro drug and this is activated uh, in the body after metabolism and it binds to three metabolites binds to three uh, different receptors the estrogen progesterone and androgen receptors in fact they they are relieve the vasomotor symptoms they are ma mainly uh, relieving these vasomotor symptoms and they are very much effective in this uh, deed and uh, they improve the libido the sexual function and uh, in fact uh, uh, urogenital atrophy and psychological symptoms but they they, they are in their uh, uh, beauty is that they don't stimulate the endometrium and so there is a uh, uh, no bleed uh, phenomenon there is bleed free uh, uh, type of hrt is these and but there is an there may be some occurrence of irregular and bleeding or spotting and that may be uh, uh, problematic uh, so that the patient i mean the, the patients or the uh, subjects they should be counseled about that there might be uh, the occurrence of some um, irregular uh, bleeding like spotting uh, so they don't should, shouldn't be worried, worried about it and the, the, this tebolon doesn't, uh, doesn't affect the venous thromboembolism or coronary artery disease, but in patients aged above 60 years or uh, in age when it is uh, started in the elder, I mean, more than 60 years uh, of elderly women, there is increased incidence of stroke. So when it is used in the younger women and in the earlier part of their menopause, even just after the menopause, there is no increased tendency, but when it is uh, started uh, lat later, uh, so it there increases it uh, this the the chance of stroke and uh, there is another problem is they increase the weight gain uh, they cause the weight gain so this is uh, there are different uh, this is a, a composite structure you can go through this it's uh, different oral uh, different routes that is through oral the transdermal the vaginal estrogen preparations the lng actually this uh, uh just still containing into the system every uh, each and every route has got there some merits and demerits like uh, oral uh, uh, the route is the mostly preferred, but it's cost effective and acceptable. But um, uh, there, there, there is uh, uh, definitely there is variation in absorption and metabolism, and there is an increase hepatic protein synthesis, sex hormone binding globulin, and coagulation factor. That is one thing. And some other uh, systemic side effects, adverse effects can happen when these uh, uh, molecules are absorbed through the GI tract. But the, whenever, uh, whenever these drugs are used in transdermal routes, there are a definite advantage. The, though the, um, uh, I mean, uh, 
the uh, systemic circulation, the, uh, the concentration of these drugs may not be uh, that much uh, of less what is being expected while using uh, through these uh, transdermal routes, but they are more physiological hormone levels than the oral therapy. That is the more important thing. They produce more physiological hormone levels than the oral therapy, and they just avoid the first pass uh, um, metabolism, that is gut and liver first pass effect, and that is the another advantage. And so uh, there is a there is the favorable uh, uh, ratio of the estradiol and estron ratio that is advantageous for these transdermal patches in comparison to the oral route. And as well as the Relenji Uterine Devices system, there is labor or just still containing uh, Uterine device that is very um, good. But that problem is that the acceptance, low acceptance rate. And uh, whenever in perimenopausal period, whenever a contraception is required, so this is very much useful when contraception is required along with the HRT in the perimenopausal period and which is very much uh, uh, acceptable and is very good uh, in uh, uh, during that uh, period. But uh, still, uh, a, a, the acceptance rate is in our country is very low uh, in comparison to the um, uh, developed countries. So next is that uh, the, the usual the dosage of this uh, uh, starting dosage of this, uh, I mean, HRT or um, menopausal hormone therapy Usually, when it is con con conjugated to estrogen, that is 0.2 milligram, or the typical dosage of the progesterone is very uh, uh, low. It is coming down 1.5 milligram from the uh, medroxy progesterone acetate to the micronized progesterone when it is used is in the term in, in the tune of 50 milligram. Um, uh, ma ma maximum 50 milligram to 100 milligram can be given in case of the micronized progesterone. That is the beauty of the micronized progesterone because it can, it is less. Advent, uh, less um, uh, the deleterious effect it poses, and that's why 50 to 100 micro milligram of micronized progesterone can be given instead of, in spite of this 1.5 milligram of medroxy progesterone acetate. And nowadays, the micronized progesterones are favored uh, with the discovery of these molecules. Uh, so now the benefits is all known. That has already been discussed. Is vasomotor symptoms improvement of this mood and sleep disturbances, which is happening in the menopause. So it's a benefit, definite benefit. Anxiety, genital urinary symptoms. It's uh, uh, it, it is nowadays it's favorable. It is being termed as genital urinary symptoms of menopause instead of urogenital atrophy. So the GSM is there is improvement of the GSM improvement of the osteoporosis has already been mentioned. Colorectal cancer according to the WHI study of uh, the estrogen progesterone arm of the WHO study which I study show that HRT reduces the risk of colorectal cancer by about one third. So there is, uh, these are the all together, these are all benefits with, for which the HRT is recommended. And, uh, but risks are definitely are there. The breast cancer risk combined with estrogen progesterone uh, preparation increases the mammographic densities. There is, an, there is a concern that this uh, combined estrogen progesterone field increases the, the, uh, the, the, the development of the breast cancer, increases the chance of breast cancer. And in fact, after the uh, term, uh, premature termination of this WHI trial, this, uh, there has been an uh, uproar of this uh, uh, increased risk of the breast cancers. And in fact, that is the main reason, one of the main reason for, for uh, not, not uh, the, the HRT or MHT not becoming so popular in the developed countries and in, in, and, and in the developing countries as well. But still, there are some issues uh, that in WHI trial that these drugs have been tried they are in a, a, a comparatively an older group of population, more than 60 years of age. And in fact, uh, uh, that might be the reason why this, um, there has been a, so, many, so much so increase in the risk of the cancers and other um, adverse effects. But whenever it has, been, it has been known, and in fact, the prospective observational study of million uh, women study in the UK found a marginally higher incidence of breast cancer with estrogen alone, but a clearly higher one when estrogen and polystyrene used in combinations. So, uh, but uh, clearly, I mean, so, so some of the studies have uh, also implicated that uh, progestin um, uh, uh, has drawn, I mean, the important factor uh, that can be when used in co combination with the estrogen that adds to the, um, uh, this deleterious effect. So, some, uh, in some uh, patients, it is being recommended that they did that the low dose estrogen might be might be beneficial and may not have uh, some extra added uh, disadvantage in terms of uh, having increased incidence of breast cancer. So now it has also been 
promoted in case of the California uh, teacher study. Uh, so what has been seen that it, here, here it has been seen that higher incidence of the cancer breast occurred in the combined combination HRT group. And when the, they have recommend, they have said that medroxy progesterone acetate was the culprit there. So uh, follow up uh, of the large uh, uh, randomized control trials are definitely uh, required because uh, there are uh, the principal modalities whether estrogen alone, estrogen combined with progesterone, or estrogen uh, combined with progesterone continuously or maybe sequentially. So there are uh, different three options. So uh, risk of breast can cancer definitely differs in these three different classes of regimens, but progesterone addition increases the breast cancer risk and then compared with the estrogen alone. And that this has to be balanced against the reduction of the risk of the progesterone with the, with, uh, in, in case uh, with, uh, towards the uh, endometrial uh, cancer risk. So progesterone agents are used to reduce the risk of the endometrial cancer, but simultaneously, they also adds to the increase in the risk of the breast cancer. So that is to be balanced with the low dose of the progesterone, maybe with the micronized progesterone, maybe started with the early onset of the uh, early onset of the menopause. Uh, so that uh, these issues are uh, these uncertainties are always there. But uh, if this is the uh, breast cancer risk and progesterone and progesterone agent selection. So you, you, you can jolly well see that the micronized progesterone, adding the micronized progesterone with the estrogen. Uh, that there is no added in this risk in terms of the breast cancer um, in, uh, occurrence. So endometrial cancer, I've already said that uh, unopposed estrogen therapy is the culprit here. So that's so that that necessitates the use of the progesterone. In fact, maybe continuously or cyclically. And um, uh, whenever whenever it is used uh, cyclically, it is to be added at least at the 10 to 12 days per month, and uh, in the in the latter half of the cycle. So three weeks on this uh, uh, estrogen, maybe the transdermal estrogen, and uh, one week off, and during that one week off, or 10 to 12 days, this uh, uh, last 10 to 12 days progesterone agent can be added. So this. Uh, cyclic sequential therapy uh, can be uh, uh, can reduce this endometrial cancer risk as well as the risk of breast cancer while adding the benefit to the to relieve in relieving the other uh, symptoms of uh, menopause, other menopausal symptoms. So the key points here: the replacement of the ovarian hormones in a close manner, so that of premenopausal functions over risk or little increase in the risk of breast and endometrial cancer. That is the key message. That is replacement of ovarian hormones uh, to, towards the uh, normalcy uh, and, um, uh, may not increase the real risk of breast and endometrial cancer. And if at all, that is very marginal. So potential uh, increases the risk of the breast and endometrial cancer in association with obesity, alcohol intake, and smoking, smoking are far more than the use of the HRT. So that is to be born in the mind and patient's education and, uh, and also the understanding by the uh, common uh, general practitioners and other practitioners is to be there and also follow up studies with the long term studies of the of the randomized control standards should be there and so <clears throat> till date whatever evidence are, uh, are there uh, regarding this uh, HRT risks like the venous thrombomolism when it is used in the earlier uh, days I mean an uh, earlier uh, period that is uh, just after the starting of the menopause there is not uh, very much increased risk of this uh, venous thromboembolism. And uh, so limited data do not suggest that increased risk of thromboembolism with Tibolone as well as in compared with the combined HRT or women not taking HRT. Gallbladder disease, this gallbladder disease also increases along, in, 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 along with, with the obesity and along with the age. So HRT increases the risk of gallbladder disease, but risk might be lower with the transdermal preparation. So, uh, this is the, uh, actually the woman in menopausal transition, what should be given the estrogen progesterone therapy, maybe lower those uh, combined uh, oral contraceptive pills and combination therapy of LNG IUVs with oral or percutaneous estrogen therapy, that might be the options. And in fact, in the individualized treatment with the patient consent should be there. So no hormone test should be there to, to diagnose the menopause. That is not advocated nowadays. So vasomotor symptoms, quality of life, that is important thing that we see, it has been seen from different studies that menopausal hormone therapy don't necessarily increase the uh, menstrual uh, symptoms, quality of life index. There's overall, they increase the general 
quality of life uh, of the person. So that's why this is advocated. They improve the vasomotor symptoms and as well as general quality of life of these particular people. And several uh, randomized control studies has confirmed the matter of fact. And that's why uh, there is a tendency to, but there is a tendency to record the symptoms whenever this therapy is discontinued. So the, this therapy, where the appropriate therapy should be continued and monitor with proper monitoring and there is no bar to limit there to, to, to stop this therapy. Neurogenital atrophy or genital atrophy symptoms I've already mentioned that that is being very much uh, uh, controlled with the use of the Tibolon. Tibolon is a very good drug in this regard and also the other lubricants, vaginal moisturizers, os ospemifen, that is a newer SARMs that is meant for these uh, conditions and vaginal DHEAs, they are also non-estrogen therapies available for treating these. And the, actually, the, for the menopausal women, they are also suffering from the overactive bladder symptoms. And for the overactive bladder symptoms, the estrogen therapy doesn't help much. Uh, so that's why it is now being recommended to use the transdermal estrogen therapy as well as along with these anti-muscarinic agents uh, to ameliorate this situation. So to, that will take care of the urogenital atrophy as well as the overactive bladder symptoms and recurrent UTI symptoms. So combination of the transdermal estrogen as well as with the anti-muscarinic agents, that is very much effective here. Sexual dysfunctions, I've already uh, mentioned, that is, a, um, uh, that is uh, HRT improves the loss of libido. And in fact, the Tibolon is a very good drug here. And the, uh, 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 the, film, the women with the hyposexual uh, disorder uh, syndrome, they are also very much, uh, uh, this is a very much preferred therapy. Uh, and percutaneous therapy uh, is, is preferred by them over the oral therapy. And tibolone is very much effective in this uh, um, particular group of people with the sexual dysfunction. Venous thromboembolism, this is the result of different studies. Uh, and uh, ultimately, this has been seen that is the, if the venous thrombolism happens, that happens in the very first year, the incidence is high. Afterwards, the incidence will gradually becomes low. And MHT incidence, the risk of venous thrombolism, that, that is the risk varies with the age, that increases with the age. So, and the MHT marginally increases, but initiating hormone therapy more than 10 years from the menopause onset, it increases the risk. So if it is to be started, it should be started better earlier and just after the, start, the starting of the menopause. And earlier it should be started around 50 to 52 years. There is no increased chance of venous thromboembolism, as I already mentioned, and uh, chance of developing venous thromboembolism. The factor the laden mutation is very low here. So Asians are less prone to develop venous thromboembolism. And uh, uncertainty is like coronary artery disease. It has already been mentioned. This uh, nurses' health study, WHI study, heart study, all over all these studies have mentioned that this the no significant reduction in risk of CHD with use of estrogen only HRT has been noted when initiated more than 10 years of menopause and in under and and, and um, under uh, uh, whenever it is above 60 years of age. But Whenever it is being used in the, uh, I mean the uh, 50 years of age and younger people, that in, reduces the chance of the coronary events by about 40 percent, according to the NARSA cell study. So the uh, but uh, stroke incidence, the stroke incidence, it has also been uh, uh, seen that incidence of stroke increases with age, and so the uh, but uh, older women starting it, it also increases uh, uh, if the HRT is being added to them in the. Um, older age, more than 60 years. And so then naturally there will be the increased incidence of the stroke. But in the LIFT study, the long-term intervention of fractures with tribulon identified significantly increased risk of stroke, mostly ischemic strokes in tribulon users if it is started more than 60 years of age. So the similar thing, and but another thing is that uh, uh, in cognition and the dementia, this, uh, it has been seen that is the Women Health Initiative study. Actually, it is also same that if it is started late, you know, what the 60 years, it increases. As you all know, that is age increases the chance of developing uh, dementia and Alzheimer's. And so uh, the BMS consensus is that the more evidence is required, especially that is British menopausal society consensus, is that especially from younger postmenopausal women as a prevention effect against the reduction of cognitive function could be expected in the actually in younger patients this uh, whenever it is started the cognitive cognitive uh, i mean the preservation of the cognitive function should is there it is expected and it has been proven it has been it is a fact that if it is started earlier there is enough preservation of cognitive function but long term data is data is required with a uh, uh, with, uh, with a long term follow up of other studies 
and but it should not be if it is started late the result is not good but rather detrimental that is as the age effect uh, is there and the uh, and in the aging population if it is started late the alzheimer's it cannot prevent alzheimer's and dementia so cancers uh, it has been already mentioned that the uh, million women study found that five years use of hrt may cause one extra case of ovarian cancer in every 2500 users and one extra death from ovarian cancer every 3300 users so uh, increased risk found in million women study for ovarian cancer is not high so that is not uh, uh, that it is not a very high incidence of ovarian cancer with the usage of this hrt and there is currently insufficient evidence what is what british menopausal society has said that to recommend alteration in the hrt being prescribing practice so now this is uh, uh, i mean i mean i am not going into the detail about this uh, what are, should be the assessment about the hrt and uh, ideally this uh, uh, this there should be a, a thorough interrogation the people should be uh, in, uh, in interviewed there should be said they should be disclosed about the all pros and cons and with the in, or proper informed informed uh, decision making should be there that they we, uh, with after getting all the informations regarding the risks and benefits the decision of starting the hrt should be there and uh, and the, this is the process of uh, uh, starting this uh, um, uh, consult i mean the communications and consultation and uh, finally uh, the patients with the uh, high risk patients with the ca breast the ca whether there is a what should be their uh, decision in case of the ca breast in fact the patients having the ca breast or history of ca breast they should not be started with the hrt hrt is hrt should not be started in those people because they have uh, uh, diagnosed breast cancer so they, it is recommended that it should not be done rather other uh, uh, anti psychotic or anti depressant agents should be tried to ameliorate the vasomotor symptoms and other things and soya uh, red clover black cohos etc and uh, they are not recommended to treatment of the menopausal syndrome in the uh this uh, breast cancer patients the patients having the breast cancer history of breast cancer uh, so, dr bakshi if you can summarize please. okay so now this is uh, the last i think uh, key points recommendations the last slide women should be able to make an informed choice on their use of hrt after being given sufficient information by their healthcare professional the regimen dose of hrt and the duration of treatment should be individualized and the risks and benefits should be reviewed on an annual basis that is very important yearly uh, um, i mean uh, monitoring uh, should be there the duration of hrt usage should be decided based on the menopausal symptoms experienced by the woman should not be subjected to arbitrary age limit there should not be there is no arbitrary age limit of the, the continuation or stoppage of the hrt that should be based on the symptom signs and patient's response uh, rate and hrd prescribed before the age of 40 years as a favorable benefit risk profile that is very important uh, take home message when prescribing hrd beyond the age of 60 years consideration should be made to using the transdermal route of administration patch or gel and not to and to using the lowest possible dose for controlling the symptoms and women with premature ovarian insufficiency premature menopause should be encouraged to use hrd at least until the age of menopause is attained that is very important and there is a pressing demand for continuous research in this field and to explore the new preparations which are coming day by day and so that we can be enriched with this newer knowledge and uh, uh, and so that we can take the well informed decisions and communicate with the patients as a uh, as well thank you very much thank you dr bakshi and uh, you have very exhaustively reviewed the subject particularly the checklist that you have used that uh, is to be discussed with the patient and identifying the individual therapeutic goal okay uh, and based on that only the treatment should be initiated and uh, all treatment should be based on the current evidences and particularly the last slide that you have summarized the recommendations you have underscored the importance of individualization of therapy thank you very much we now go to uh, because of scarcity of time we now go directly to the next presentation by dr shambhu somrat samajdar who is also a clinical pharmacologist by training and uh, uh, he is of a prolific prolific practitioner uh, i now request dr shambhu somrat samajdar to speak on the importance of treatment adherence in menopausal uh, women with menopausal symptoms and uh, the menopausal hormone therapy dr shambhu somrat samajdar thank you sir thank you uh, for giving me this opportunity to talk about the 
medication importance of medication adherence of the menstrual uh, menopausal hormonal therapy so first of all what is adherence that means the extent to which a person's behavior of taking medication following a diet and or executing different lifestyle changes that corresponds with agreed recommendations from a healthcare provider so here one of the most important thing is that that agreed recommendation who is agreed the patient is agreed so if the, the there should be a informed uh, decision uh, informed prescribing patient should be convinced otherwise that is not the adherence so i am just want to focus uh, on the adherence part with some real world cases that is a healthy 50 year old menopausal woman non obese 10 month history of menopausal symptoms there is was worsening of hot flashes soaking night sweats and sleep disturbances with fatigue and generally that affect her work she had a she, her mother had a breast cancer history at 78 years of age and this particular patient has heard that hormone therapy may be harmful but worries about the functioning at the ward so she needs to be uh, attentive during her work and with that she had again a fear of breast cancer so how would you advise this patient so this is number one case and number two case is very straight forward that is 43 year lady recently had hysterectomy with bilateral salpingo hysterectomy she has heard about hormone therapy in men menopause and then uh, she wants to start hormone therapy and visit you so the, the this these two are very common cases we generally encountered in our day to day practice so what is important there is a difference between these two cases mm-hmm. one is obviously there is a surgical menopause and other is that is a natural menopause that requires some hormone therapy so regarding the adherence what is important first is to initiation initiation of the therapy so here there is a very important study which suggests that probability of starting hormone replacement is approximately five times greater among the surgically menopausal women than among those who undergo the natural transition so our second case is much more easier compared to the first case to initiate hormone replacement so what are the most important concerns while we start hormone therapy in the menopausal women number one the fear of cancer and that is the most frequent reason for refusal of hormone replacement therapy and number two is the vaginal bleeding which is the most frequent reason for discontinuation so surgically menopausal women typically continue with this hormone replacement therapy for longer because there is no risk of endometrial cancer or withdrawal bleeding because if we if there is already the uterus is not there there is no fear of endometrial cancer and we can use the estrogen only therapy and if we can use estrogen only therapy there is much lesser risk or no risk of breast cancer so few another studies done in north american population in in those they found that 34% of women between 45 and 60 years they were currently using hormone replacement therapy 
percent had used hormone replacement therapy in the past, but were no longer using it. And this is important that 58 percent have never used it. Among them, 14 percent reported that they had refused the medication or had decided not to take the medication, although it was prescribed by their physicians. So this is why the adherence and compliance is a very important issue while deciding on this specific therapy. So another retrospective study done by Ravinkar et al, which suggests uh, that among more than 300 naturally postmenopausal women, the overall compliance was only 30%. And another study done in the Massachusetts followed up of 2,500 women, and here the age group is 45 to 55 year old. So within nine months after the prescription, 20% of the women had stopped using hormone replacement therapy. 10% of the women used it intermittently and 30% had never filled their prescriptions. This, this is generally a record-based study from the pharmacist. So compliance is poor. And while we are talking about compliance, it is important there is a certain difference between adherence and compliance. In compliance, there is no way to involve your patient. When you are involving your patient, that is an informed shared uh, or a shared decision making, that time it is adherence. But when you are not including or accepting your patient's decision in treatment, then that is only compliance. And always compliance is much inferior than adherence. So it is our responsibility to improve adherence. So there is definite evidence that while we are getting hormone replacement therapy or menopausal hormonal therapy, there is a symptomatic benefit, there is a cardiovascular benefit, there is an anti-osteoporotic benefit of the hormone. So why do women choose not to take or stop taking hormone replacement therapy? So this was a question-based study and the reasons most commonly cited by the woman who choose not to take hormone replacement therapy. Number one, and maximum of the response are like that, that hormones were not needed. Some of the women told that menopause is a natural event. So why will I, I will take hormone for that? Definitely, there is a concerns regarding that side effects. There are some physicians advice. That means the primary care physicians whom they believe they are, they are having some opposing uh, opinion regarding the hormone uh, therapy. And other reasons like fear of cancer and some of them who not wants menstrual periods or bleeding, that is another concern. It, this is generally common when we add progestin uh, with estrogen. So why, how to improve adherence? Obviously, one of the key important thing is that good physician-patient interaction. Long-term continuance rate is highest among patients who leave the physician's office understanding exactly why they are taking that or what they are taking. That means if they, they are convinced with physician's advice, that will improve adherence. And other strategies to improve communications, because communication is one of the important weapon to fight against non-adherence. Number one, the, in, ensuring the uninterrupted discussions with the patient and creating an accessible office atmosphere. Repetition is often required 
and the repetition of key message is sometimes very very important in this in this type of things an equation approach to evaluating the benefits and risk involves the patients in the decision process and clarifies the reasons that she may or may not choose to begin hormone replacement therapy so again the importance of shared decision making so we need to educate our patients regarding the benefit and risk of hormone therapy so this was a study done in croatia that adherence with hormone replacement therapy in menopause so in case of low interest in menopause that means there is three group of doctors who are who have low interest in menopause medium in, in interest in menopause and high interest in menopause and it was seen in the group where the doctors have higher interest in menopause and devotes more time in menopausal therapy there is less dropping out from hormone replacement therapy so doctors interest is very important and average duration of therapy is also correlated with high level of interest among the physicians a treat, uh, uh, pro, pro, uh, treatment providing gynecologist generally it is important to note that in croatia the time when the study was done the primary care physicians uh, cannot prescribe hormone replacement therapy the gynecologist had that credential to prescribe hormone replacement therapy so here we can see again different groups of uh, gynecologist like primary care gynecologist who are giving more uh, times like 14.2 the clinical hospital gynecologist who are giving 15.5 uh, minutes like that so the maximum time was spent by the private gynecologist 26.5 and now you, we can see the adherence or or or, or we can see uh, the, 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 there are some other important issue like sexuality because we from a doctor side have a often uh, have a resistance to start the discussion regarding the sexuality of the of, of that particular patient and this also seen across the area except there are some primary care gynecologist private who have a more intense discussion on sexuality along with the primary care gynecologist public whereas the gynecologist in clinical hospital that means high level of hospitals and general hospital they are not that much talking primary care gps there are this particular study is interesting to show that there is a increased tendency that like 82% of them talked about sexuality and what is important regarding in this particular study even among the doctors who are gynecologist and gps they in case of gynecologist or we can say the male gynecologist when they are asked would you recommend to the partner the hormone replacement therapy they told 100% of them told yes but when a female gynecologist there we can see 100% is not recommending for hormone replacement therapy there there the percentage is like that 93% similar things when the gps when they they were asked about would they recommend their partner there is 80% told that yes they will recommend but in case of the female gps the percentage is quite low so there is some confusion regarding that hormone therapy in all level we need to improve our awareness regarding that so i am coming again as as we talked about the cases so if there is there that two cases if there is menopausal symptoms and that menopausal symptoms if only genito urinary symptoms then we can use some moisturizers or lubricants 
and local therapies, local estradiol tablets or some conjugate estrogen cream. But if that is there is some symptoms like hot flashes, night sweats, just what happened in our past case, then we have to see when there is age is less than 60 year or within 10 years of menopause with some symptoms. Obviously, our patient has some symptoms. Otherwise, no contraindications, moderate to severe hot flashes, no response to behavioral interventions. And in case of primary ovarian insufficiency, then they are the candidate for hormone therapy. Whereas all the other cases with high risk of breast cancer, heart disease, thromboembolism, or other estrogen sensitive cancer or precancerous patients, other uh, history like stroke, myocardial infarction, or pulmonary uh, embolism, age is more than 60 years or more than 10 years of menopause, they are the candidate for non hormonal therapy. And this already discussed who are the candidate for hormonal or hormone therapy and what we should choose. Just like in case of transdermal therapy, these are the options. And whether, of, uh, like in presence of obesity, diabetes, hypertriglyceride, it is better to consider transdermal therapy. If uterus is present, then it is important to consider both estrogen and progestin. And when it is absent, hysterectomy, then consider estrogen alone. For non-hormonal therapy, there are other pharmacological therapies like that. So in our first case, if the patient has a, a mammogram done, already this patient, as there is a positive family history and the mammogram was okay, so this patient was initiated with estrogen-only uh, estrogen therapy and they were followed up for transvaginal sonography also and patient was continuing estrogen-based hormone therapy. And our second case, who's, who was also, uh, who do, don't have uh, uterus, they also initiated with hormone therapy. But important is that we have to make them understand the risk and benefit of hormone replacement therapy. So when the woman ages between 50 to 59 and or less than 10 years of menopause, then the risk is with both estrogen and estrogen progesterone, the gallbladder related risk is high. There is a venothrombotic episodes Though with only estrogen, that risk is quite low compared to the estrogen plus progesterone. Stroke, there is some increased risk in that hormone therapy. Regarding breast cancer, if we combine estrogen and progesterone, there is obvious re higher risk in that group. But if we use only estrogen, that may be beneficial in preventing breast cancers and all the other other areas what we we uh, we see we can see from this picture like fractures diabetes colorectal cancer even overall mo mortality it, uh, uh, coronary heart disease in all aspect there is a benefit in favor of postmenopausal hormone therapy so we need to address this, we need to tell this to our patient and shared decision making is very important for them. We have to simplify the regimen. We have to inform, we have to do the justice with, for informed prescribing, modify the patient's belief and behavior by proper education, by improving health literacy. The trust is important. Communication is important. We need to provide more and more time because time is important factor which improve adherence. And obviously we should leave the bias. We should not be biased to anything. We need to do justice with the evidences what we have. And repeatedly, we need to evaluate the adherence when we can we see the patient. And there are some study which also suggest that 
if we have closer follow up that helps improving adherence so closer follow up sometimes is required so thank you all so today is we all know about those we need to be colorful so it is important to uh keep the adequate color to the post menopausal women also thank you very much over to you sir Hello Hello Professor Tripathi has left probably his name is not there in the things but anyway who is there to conclude Oh I think so I think uh, uh, ha huh, dr tripathi is there huh. yeah uh, i i got disconnected 2 minutes back now i have been in now so uh, i i don't think there are we have enough time for discussion we had lot of discussion also uh, i would request dr mukherjee to have a few words to conclude today's session dr mukherjee please uh this this uh, is always uh, a learning curve for everybody who, who joins these seminars and uh, it was a, a very informative uh, seminar and uh, most of the seminars that we attend are uh, with the gynecologists only and uh, the questions are necessarily very clinical so the last speaker uh, did uh, start with a case and uh, if i can recall i think this was published in the new england journal last year this case uh, this the first case at least and uh, very illuminating and uh, people should be going uh, to the evidence rather than going to old textbooks this is very important and old textbooks other than students are not good enough so i have heard both of these speakers the last two speakers the first one i have already commented and the last two speakers also did a very good job of uh, summarizing the benefits and the harms and uh, the last speaker also told us a little bit about uh, adherence which is very important because most of the people who are put on hormone therapy you don't expect them to continue long because that is the trend so it is something that we can inculcate to the undergraduate students and the postgraduate students the general physicians as well as the gynecologists that uh, there should be a proper education on this and the uh, emphasis should be that people where it should not be started in people who do not have an indication for it on the other hand with proper indications there should be there should be no reason to withhold the the hormone therapy so thank you dr tripathi for inviting me to be a co chair person with you and uh, i have thoroughly enjoyed uh, being a uh, a uh, co chair person with you and uh, the speakers they have done a very good job so they must be congratulated also thank you thank you thank you very much uh, professor mukherji uh, yes so far as adherence is concerned it is not an isolated uh, thing from the uh, right kind of approach towards management rational decision making in an individual patient whether or not it has to be started and then such decision of starting is to be also decided in discussion thorough discussion with the patient uh, that has been also highlighted by dr somazdar 
and uh, and then only you can expect an optimum adherence and uh, of course there should be also a scope for continuous monitoring of the patient because otherwise if it is left uh, uh, to the to the uh, choice of the patient whenever he will feel some kind of discomfort side effect or otherwise anxiety he, uh, she will stop uh, all by herself which is not really good so adherence is an issue adherence is a concept which cannot be considered in isolation it has to be otherwise integrated with therapeutic decision making and proper monitoring so that may be our take home message today overall all the three speakers and da have done justice to the topic it's a huge topic really difficult to cover in a couple of hours time but then i must congratulate uh, dr goswami the first speaker dr bagji the second speaker and dr shamazda and i must thank the organizers also i know who care health of solutions to taking up this challenge of having series of uh, sessions uh, around the theme of treatment adherence so three are over and there are nine more to come one every month so thank you all all the listeners all the members of the audience and uh, i must thank dr sunip banerji a senior cardiologist who also spared his time to be with us and for a brief spell we also had some discussion thank you again dr mukherji dr bagji dr shamazdar and dr goswami thank you all thank you sir over. thank you over thank you sir thank, thank you everybody thank you very much